Okay, so welcome to our spring semester um, of chemistry seminar, spring 2022. And we have a really good lineup. I think we have about 15 speakers lined up, uh, lots of different cool topics. Today's included. And um, as I said before, just um, one of the things we like to encourage all of you students to do is to take part in our question and answer. Um, our, our speakers really appreciate that actually. So looking forward to that session as well. Uh, today, uh, one of our students, Annalise Tessely, she's a biochemistry major at pre-med and uh, she's going to introduce our speaker for today. But a little bit about Annalise is that she's a sophomore. Actually, I think she, Annalise, you in my class this semester, right? The OCHEM lab? Uh, yes, that's correct. That's right, yeah. And um, you went to school, she went to school at Hinsdale Adventist Academy and her hometown is Westmont, Illinois. How close is Westmont to Hinsdale? Um, it's very close, probably a 20 minute drive. Oh, okay. You didn't yeah. get, get too far away from home, huh? Yeah. Okay. So she's interested in pursuing a career in medicine. And I was just talking to our speaker. He did an MD PhD. So you guys, that could be a, a subject um, of discussion if you wish. Um, she has, I don't know if it's a continuing hobby, but you still play the oboe? Uh, yes, I do. You do? Very nice, yeah. very nice. Multi-talented. So Annalise, go ahead and introduce our speaker for us today. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, today, I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Ryan Flynn. Dr. Ryan Flynn is a New Jersey native who completed his undergraduate training at MIT, where he worked in the lab of Philip Sharp on small non-coding RNA biology. Then he moved to Stanford, where he completed his MD and, P and PhD under the mentorship of Howard Chang. Here, he worked on developing methods to study RNA protein interactions. And from his work, he won the Weintraub Graduate Student Award. As a postdoc, he changed fields to learn both chemistry and glycobiology with Carolyn Bertosi at Stanford as a Damon Runyon Cancer Research Postdoctoral Fellow. At the beginning of 2021, the Flynn Lab opened at Boston Children's Hospital in the Stem Cell Program and the Department of Stem Cell and Regenerative Biology at Harvard University. And the Flynn Lab is currently working, is currently focused on advancing methods and mechanisms surrounding the glyco RNA molecule. So please join me in virtually welcoming Dr. Ryan. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Annalise, uh, for the intro. And uh, I'm excited to be able to talk to everyone today, share a little bit about um, maybe the, the logic of how we got to the, this idea and this observation, and then a little bit about the stuff we're working on now in the lab. So the title uh, that I have here today summarizes a little bit about how we think about, how we're thinking about the, the work in the lab. And um, we really think that glycoRNAs are gonna be a first example of this, uh, this interface between RNA biology and glycobiology. Uh, we think it's gonna be a very exciting and interesting first example, but just hopefully one of many. So I'll, I'll begin with kind of a, a general overview of how I like to think. Uh, a little bit about biology and the way the questions manifest out of my out of my head, um, and and sort of to start with that, it's it's so kind of the way I imagine molecules and information moving around. And so many will be kind of familiar with the idea that, uh, of course, our DNA, our genomes store information, and this gets converted into RNA and kind of literally flows into the protein space uh, as the RNAs are translated. But for a long time, I'd been interested in understanding what and if anything else RNA can do, if it um, does anything outside of being a passive messenger. So how can RNA work on the proteins or the DNA 
um, uh, outside of this canonical role. And so the, the kind of <clears throat> abstract idea is that, you know, um, how can RNA regulate biology rather than simply be this, this uh, carrier of information? And so I'm going to highlight a couple of um, maybe obvious examples, but the, but the key is kind of their core focus on RNA. And so many may be familiar with the spliceosome because it's really important in making mRNAs and producing proper long coding RNAs. But it's a really interesting example because it's, a, it's an RNA machine. It scaffolds other RNAs. It, it holds together mRNAs and cuts them and re-splices them. And then it scaffolds trans RNAs, but in its core, it's a catalytic RNA. It's a, it's a ribozyme. And so this, this machine that processes RNAs is itself an RNA. Another example is the ribosome. And so when you think about the ribosome, you probably think about translation and proteins and you know, protein expression and things. But if you look at it molecularly, the ribosome is just another big ball of RNA. You have huge ribosomal RNAs that together string through it an mRNA that is being unwound. You have tRNAs coming in and literally reading the mRNA sequence and information and then physically conducting that and translating it into poly, you know, into amino acids, which then later are catalyzed to form a new polymer proteins by an RNA enzyme. And so I think the ribosome is another really interesting example of, of a, a sort of a core RNA biology feature being extremely central to uh, cell biology and sort of just pretty much everything that, that, we, that we use. Um, I think ribose switches are another really cool example, a little more poorly studied, but these are smaller structural features, uh, structural elements in RNAs that can sense uh, small molecules and other environmental features and then respond uh, structurally and organizationally to, for example, change the stability uh, of that RNA or the gene expression of a, of a sort of in cis uh, like protein coding gene, for example. So these are, I think, are really interesting examples of how RNA itself can actually regulate biology. But this, and, and in particular, these are often catalytic RNAs themselves. But there's another sort of level that, that biology operates on, and that's how RNA can actually control the catalysis or guide the catalysis of proteins. And so there are some nice examples, for example, in um, gene expression and, and the modulation of mRNA expression, you have argonaut proteins being guided by microRNAs in the context of you know, immune surveillance, <clears throat> the Cas9 proteins, and of course, in genome engineering, the Cas9 proteins use RNAs to target their catalytic activity to DNA. And in, in contexts where you actually have to deposit uh, chemical modifications to RNA, there are also RNA-guided enzymes, such as methyltransferases, that use complementary bases to find their RNA targets and then deposit that methylation mark. <clears throat> so this is another example, another sets of examples of how RNA can be really important for uh, kind of common tasks that, that uh, if you just think about the blobs on a paper, you might not realize how critical the RNA component is. Uh, but so now, like just for a moment, I wanna focus a little bit on this last example um, and think more about what RNA modifications can do and why they're so interesting. And uh, biology sort of evolved a lot of mechanisms around RNA modification to help control and um, fine tune the, the activity of, of, of RNA. And so if we take again this example of fibrillarin, which is a methyl transferase, and it's uh, targeting RNAs, small nucleolar RNAs or snow RNAs, we can imagine what it would do if we added, for example, a methyl group, a singular methyl group on the 2 prime hydroxyl of an RNA. So you take this otherwise kind of uh, bland RNA uh, ch chemistry, which is some phosphates and some bases, and you add a methyl group. <clears throat> and then it turns out some really interesting uh, things can happen. So if you want to make ribosomes, you actually need 106 in humans, two primal methylation sites to make fully formed, uh, fully folded and active ribosomes. Without these methylations, the ribosome doesn't work correctly. Now, if you push this methyl group somewhere else, let's say on the base of an adenine, now we might be more focused on messenger RNAs and how methylation on specific things like the five prime cap or near the three prime ETR 
could modulate its function in the context of translational efficiency or the, the molecular sort of stability of that mRNA. And so this is just methylation, right? And this is just two different positions for methylation. But uh, we don't have methylation. We don't, we don't only have methylation. You know, we don't only have one position adenine in a two prime hydroxyl. We have lots and lots of opportunities for chemical elaboration. And so the, the idea here is that you can take what is otherwise um, at its synthesis, at its, its polymerization state, relatively simple bases and, and chemical compositions and dramatically expand this to have uh, you know, hundreds, 150 modifications, um, depending on what organism and, and what, what way you're counting, but, but over 100 modifications, um, which can change all sorts of chemical properties of the, of the RNA polymer. And what this really means is that you have an enormous chemical diversity of RNA, where when you might otherwise normally think of proteins as being this highly diverse, highly chemically elaborated and flexible biopolymer, you can actually think about RNA in the same way. And this idea in general was, was very attractive to me because I've always thought RNA was very, very cool and didn't like the idea that proteins were somehow uh, better, than, <laughs> better than RNA. <laughs> so when I, when I was trying to think about things and I was sort of synthesizing uh, goals and, and curiosity from coming from my grad school into my, into my postdoc, I was wondering sort of what are the differences and, and, and parallels between RNA, the RNA world and the protein world. And in the, in the modification space, there seem to actually be a lot, of, a lot of similarities. So you can get methylated RNA and proteins and acetylated um, proteins and RNA and hydroxylated proteins and RNA. And there are interesting examples of uh, at least short lipid chains being, um, added to RNAs, and there's a lot of uh, lipid modified uh, protein examples, but there was this large class of protein PTMs, protein post-transitional modifications that seemed totally absent from RNA. And this is basically the entire field of glycobiology. Every other polymer, as I'll talk about in a second, gets a glycan except RNA, uh, well, except nucleic acids at least. And so this was sort of um, just a question mark that I had initially, I didn't really, uh, know what the answer was. It didn't really seem like when you read about this, anyone had said yes or no. It was just that lipids and proteins get glycans. And then that was the way it was phrased. It wasn't ever described that RNA and DNA don't get it. So it was very hard to know whether someone had looked and didn't find anything or looked and didn't know what they had found. So anyway, I had this question mark here. And as I was able to write this question mark out, I kind of realized I don't really even know what glycosylation is. I should probably like read about what this whole arm of biology is. And so uh, the, you know, the high level and the kind of the cute way of saying this is that it's the sweet part of our cell. It's the part where all sugar um, uh, monosaccharides uh, kind of are, are, are uh, mostly levered, um, especially in particular biopolymers themselves. And so um, the kind of base unit is a monosaccharide. One of these is shown here, it's called sialic acid. Um, very few people like spending all the time to draw all of these chemical structures out. So we end up just cartooning them with these colored shapes. And that uh, uh, simplifies everything. And then it makes the figures look a little nicer and, and easier, to, easier to interpret. And, and then we can, we can illustrate kind of how uh, a glycobiology um, view of, of, for example, a cell membrane might look like. And so the, the sort of bottom part of this figure is illustrating, again, uh, let's say the plasma membrane, where the cytosol is kind of empty here, but it's on the bottom. And then you have the extracellular space spacing on the top or the cell surface on the top. And the details are not really important. The, the kind of high level feature that I want to describe are a few things. So you can see that there are some protein squiggles on the left and some lipid squiggles on the right. There's a bunch of colors, there's a bunch of shapes, and then the shapes and colors are all mixed. There's, there's a bunch of different configurations. Um, there's even a triple hybrid uh, GPI anchor thing all the way on the right-hand side, which has lipid and glycan and protein. And so the cell has decided to have this enormous diversity and complexity of biopolymers. Um, uh, sitting outside on the cell surface. And sort of in this context, 
um, it turns out this is a, an enormously conserved arm of biology. And it, it sort of glycans and, and this layer of, of carbohydrates is, is present on all uh, living cells and, and organisms. Viruses even steal, steal these glycans and, and, and lever glycans from, from the host that they infect. Um, so the, the sort of importance is kind of communicated in their function. So they can regulate things like membrane biophysics, how cells interact with each other, how cells are physically conformed. And then uh, maybe not surprisingly, um, you know, how, how uh, other cells of other organisms, for example, so pathogens interface with the, with the host. They're heavily regulated by the glycospace. There's a, there's a lot of work uh, that's, been, that's been going on in terms of understanding the glycosylation of SARS-CoV-2 spike protein and how that regulates uh, interactions and, and signaling. Um, and then not surprisingly, given the space and how, how it's basically a cell-cell communication issue, there's an enormous uh, uh, role of glycans in immune regulation. So, uh, you know, as I was learning about this and, and realizing that basically every other biopolymer is involved in this, it was kind of surprising to me having spent probably the better part of 10 years thinking about RNA, that RNA would be excluded from this process. Because I was coming from this view that RNA is the most important thing in the cell. And then here we have a piece of biology that doesn't care about RNA. And that was very sad to me. <laughs> and so, and so, you know, I was just thinking like, well, okay, fine. This is, this is, this is reasonable, like whatever. This is just the way, this is the way the world works. Um, but I, but, you know, I, I kind of, you know, you can try to zoom out so I could like actually ask a specific question. And so when I was trying to zoom out, I, I put a picture of a cell in my head and I asked like, where, where is RNA? Where does it actually go? And what do we actually know about it? And so of course, RNA comes from our genome, out of our of our DNA, and so it, there's RNA in the nucleus, which makes sense. Um, the RNA is shipped to the cytosol for translation and many other processes. Of course, there's RNA in the cytosol. There's a lot of really cool RNA biology that actually occurs on the cell membrane. So, for example, translation occurs on the ER uh, membrane itself, and there are other uh, ways to to target and isolate RNAs on either the plasma membrane or the ER for sequestration or other regulation. So there's on membrane RNA biology, which is very cool. I think relatively, unfair, but that's a separate topic. Um, in addition, there's this sort of this like evolving and, and sort of ever growing uh, set of literature around RNA and vesicles like exosomes and microvesicles and how cell-cell communication can occur through packaging of, of RNAs and vesicles. But the piece about this is that the, the inside of those vesicles is often actually the cytosol. So it's, it's actually packaging up the cytosol and shipping it to different places. And what I was curious about was inside the vesicles. So inside the luminal spaces of organelles like the ER and the Golgi. And the reason why I was curious about this was because what, where, where the glycans are is in this space. So the glycans seem to be sequestered away from RNA. And I wanted to know, is that true? Was there actually no RNA in this space? And so that was sort of the question that I was actually really curious about. I didn't have any real um, hypotheses yet around whether there was a modified version of RNA. I was curious about a localization question. I wanted to understand why couldn't RNA get into this place or, or, or could it, right? And so then kind of like, with that motivation, the question was, well, how do you even ask that question? What's the, what's the way to figure that out? And I thought, well, um, the cell doesn't seem to care. <laughs> the cell will put a glycan on a lipid. The cell will put a glycan on a protein. It's because they get into the lumen. Um, and then you get these glycolipids and glycoproteins and whatever else. So I thought, well, if RNA was in the lumen, which is the question I had, maybe it gets a glycan. So I thought that maybe we could just use this like secondary effect potentially of it being in this space as the readout for whether the biology was happening the way I wanted it to. And so then now the question was, if we wanna look for glycan on an RNA, how do we see that? What's gonna be the easiest way? And I thought taking a chemical approach would be, would be convenient because you can really with high specificity address the chemistry. You can pick which biopolymer you want uh, and, and you can use specific pairs of functional groups to then read out what's going on. And so the kind of the broader paradigm of this is, is metabolic reporters or metabolic incorporation. And so if you're 
you know, if you just want to study RNA, you might use 5-ethanyluridine. Um, if you want to study protein synthesis or other features, you might use a, a reagent called l azetohoma alanine. And the kind of key with these, with these reagents is that they incorporate uh, uh, these, these functional uh, click handles, which allow for bioorthogonal chemistry to occur. And then you can install some sort of functional group like a biotin or a fluorophore for detection later of, of your you know, favorite biopolymer like RNA or protein. Um, but as a, as a postdoc, you know, thinking about glycobiology and being in the Bertozzi lab, I was very lucky because uh, Carolyn had been developing all of this chemistry and then also all the tools to study these questions in the context of glycobiology. And so this peracetylated mannaz molecule here in, in the third column is the, is the one that I was gonna use to, to start off these studies. And um, when you treat cells with this uh, chemical, what happens is it goes inside of cells through a series of enzymatic conversions gets made into uh, new 5 as or a precursor to sialic acid. And sialic acid is that first, that first uh, monosaccharide I showed you, but this one now has an azide in it. And what will happen is the cell will just put this, this uh, chemical into any of the terminal ends of the glycans that it's, that it's producing, um, that it's producing with sialic acid. Um, and it doesn't know what it's doing so it's going to put them into protein glycans and lipid glycans. And I figured any other glycan that has a sialic acid. And so the, the strategy we, we decided to take was one that was very common. You could simply take uh, cell culture, uh, you know, cultured cells, add this reagent. And normally what you would do is extract proteins or extract lipids. And so I thought, well, if we just extract the RNA that everyone throws away, we could ask if something else was going on. Um, and, and see what see what was happening. And again, because our metabolic reporter has an azide, we could use an alkyne pair. Um, and in, in this case, I used a, a copper-free click um, strained alkyne that had a biotin on it. So we could uh, take the RNAs, label them with this biotinylation reagent, run them out in a gel to separate out by size, and then transfer it to a membrane to detect that biotin. So that was the sort of like, simple setup that we were gonna that we were gonna go down the path of. And you know, sort of the way these gels are gonna look um, for the talk is this where you have a an agrose, a denaturing agrose gel and, and you can see the major uh, ribosomal bands and small RNA bands from a from a cell. And we did a great job extracting RNA. So that's really nice. Everything has nice and crisp bands. Everything is intact. And so then we're gonna transfer this gel to a membrane and then image for anything that has a biotin in it. And then again, the idea is that the biotin is a proxy for that mannaz, which should be very selectively incorporated only into glycans. And so when we did this, we saw this pretty interesting and exciting result, I'd say. And you know, the, the, the results are obvious here, just that there was any signal. That was the first, <laughs> the first question was like, does, do we see any signal? Because we didn't have to see anything. Um, and uh, sort of really interestingly in a, in a sort of a time-dependent manner, when we added mannaz for longer and longer, we could get more and more signal accumulating from the cells. And so the question was, uh, what is this? Like, we would think it's RNA based on the process, but we wanted to really make sure because there's uh, lots of other reasons why you could get signal from something else that, that might co-purify. So we took a, a sort of a more stringent approach and we used a, a, a highly, a really harsh region called trizol, which has high salt and uh, phenyl chloroform. And so you can really denature proteins, you can really denature other biopolymers to get rid of the DNA. We, we additionally took a, a, an enzymatic approach in, in series to sort of to, to shred as much as we could away contaminant other proteins or other things that might be around. And then we repeated that blot and you know, really nicely got a very similar result in that first lane, but start, now started to actually address what was the signal coming from. And so if we treated the sample with DNAs, nothing happened. Everything was the same. If we treated samples with RNAs, signal went totally away. Um, this is very cool and some of the first evidence that it was an RNA dependent signal. But one concern we had was what if the RNA stuff we got was dirty? What if you know, you're purifying this out of uh, bovine pancreas and some other weird, en weird enzyme activities coming down with the nucleus activity? What, what, that's why we're getting rid of the signal. So we did this last control experiment where we could add an RNA inhibitor, 
So same amount of RNAs, but now an inhibitor that's gonna selectively kill the uh, enzymatic activity of the RNAs, and we show that we recovered that signal. So it's not something random that's in the RNA stock that we have, but really it's the RNAs activity that is destroying our signal. And it was sort of at this point that we called this, this signal uh, a glycoRNA, whatever that, whatever that uh, name means to anyone. But that's where, this is where we started to, to think about the, bi the biomolecule in this, in this form. And now the other thing to consider from this gel is um, looking at where the signal is migrating versus that molecular weight ladder on the left-hand side. If you look at the numbers, this is a, a very, very long RNA or apparently very long RNA because it's migrating above the 9,000 nucleotide marker, which is a very large RNA for, for biology. So I assumed that this was gonna be a long encoding RNA. And it turns out that I was, I was very wrong about that. Um, but to, to show a single example of, of how we started to figure this out, uh, I'll show you a sucrose uh, density gradient. And so through sucrose, you can spin uh, RNA samples and, and really nicely in this bottom gel separate out with, with pretty fine resolution, the molecular weights of RNA. Mm -hmm. So this is gonna be uh, purely in the sucrose dimension by the mass of the RNA. And the agarose dimension, it's molecular shape. And so when we, when we did, transferred this gel to the membrane, we got a really weird and interesting result, which was that all of our very slowly migrating signal, which we would think would be a very long RNA, actually only fractionates, it's exclusively fractionating with the short RNAs, the small molecular weight RNAs, which suggested to us that the, there's a decoupling in the way this biomolecule is running in an agarose matrix from its molecular weight. And there might be something weird about the way the glycan is pushing it through or not letting it be pushed through the agarose matrix. So the short story here is that they're small RNAs, but which ones, right? So we have to do some sequencing. So we moved to a system where we could uh, start to compare against different um, cell conditions. So we looked at a, an immortalized uh, cancer cell line called HeLa, and we looked at human ES cells, which are uh, Similarly, continuously dividing, but they're kind of, uh, they're not really immortalized on purpose. Um, and so we have these like nice controls where if we add RNAs, we have no RNA and in, in the negative, we have no, we have no treatment. And if we do our, our man-NAS blotting, we get this like really fantastic, interesting result where HeLa cells have a little bit of a blobby glycoRNA thing going on at the top, but then these ES cells are totally blown up. They have so much signal. It's crazy. So we thought, well, first of all, they're fully RNA sensitive. So that's a great, another great quality control. But we thought this is going to be excellent. HeLa cells are cancer. They're cultured in different media. They don't grow in colonies. ES cells have all these different properties. And look at this, look at this gel. We're going to find all this interesting cell type specific uh, glycoRNA transcript information. So what we did was we sequenced these two and we compared the enrichments that we got from the sequencer. So we looked for RNAs that were enriched to HeLa cells, and we plotted that in a, in a two-dimensional graph against the RNAs we got in the ES cells. And what we found was plotted in this somewhat dense uh, plot, but I'll go through it. The first thing to notice, um, the H9, the ES cells are on the x-axis and the HeLa cells are on the y-axis. And what you can probably appreciate is that there's a diagonal line between these two. And the diagonal means there's, they're, they're quantitatively similar, they're correlated in their enrichments. So if you were a glycoRNA in human ES cells, you were also a glycoRNA to the same degree in HeLa cells, which was super surprising given the, on the left-hand side. So that was already interesting and said that there's some selection mechanism that's common between these two very distinct cell states. And then on top of that, when you look at what are the actual names that we've annotated here, what are the actual transcripts? They're small non-coding RNAs. So they're snRNAs, SNO RNAs, Y RNAs, and tRNAs. We didn't find any microRNAs, and I don't yet know why that is, but every other type of small RNA that cells make were, showed up in here. And this uh, pattern was not dependent on expression. So the expression of each of these RNAs is, is not anti-correlated, but it's not correlated with their enrichment. So it's not just that, for example, uh, you know, SNORD35A is very highly expressed 
it's not the most highly expressed SNORT, even though it's one of the most highly enriched. So the summary till now is just that small RNA are modified. Um, but I think now the question is modified with what? I've been telling you this glycans, but all, all I really know is that this MANAS region is able to pull it down. And so we should probably be really specific and start getting information around what is the sugar and how is it connected to the RNA that we're looking at. So in glycobiology, there are two major N glycan uh, families, N and O, and they're uh, sort of characterized by the type of atoms that are connecting the carbohydrate polymer to the template. Um, so if we uh, wanted to start address this, it was very easy to take enzymes that would cut each of these types selectively and then ask it what was going on with our signal. I mentioned that the, the man-NAS is these, gonna be monitoring these purple diamonds, so sialic acid, and there is a sialidase that can cut the sialic acids off. And it turns out that if you use sialidase, you can get rid of all of your signal. So we have a positive control to say, we know we can cut off those purple diamonds and we, we can see a, a change in our assay. Now, if we go to try to cut O-glycans off, we never saw any difference. If we went to cut N-glycans of the type that are called, quote, high manos, that's like the, the actual structures are shown in uh, below, um, we didn't also see much of a difference. There was not a lot of impact with high manos cutting. But when we used the really broad spectrum N-glycanates called P and JSF, there was really robust destruction of our signal. So this was telling us that the signal is likely coming from an N-glycan structure, but you know, we wanted to get better resolution. So we went into cells, and we started to inhibit different pathways and different enzymes um, along the sort of physical track that N-glycans take, starting in the ER and moving through the Golgi. So the major N-glycan, uh, uh, like N-glycotransferase is called OST. It's a complex that sits in the ER uh, membrane. And we can inhibit this with, with a chemical inhibitor called NGI1. And NGI1 can actually quantitatively destroy the glycoRNA signal. But you'll notice that it just depletes the signal. It doesn't really change its molecular weight at all. And the reason why I make that note is because if we go later into the pathway and we inhibit enzymes that rather than have a binary yes or no glycosylation, but rather have a compositional change, you can see the structure difference between those last two cartoons. What we see now is both a loss of signal, but also a change in molecular weight and a pretty dramatic change in molecular weight if you look carefully at the third lane of that kippen S blood. So when you change the glycoform, you change the composition of the carbohydrate, you can dramatically change the structure or the, the, the running, the molecular weight of the signal in the gel. We saw the same thing with, the, with inhibiting a later monosidase. And again, you can see a, a loss of signal when you inhibit the flux of this pathway, but also a change in the molecular weight. So this is all pointing towards N-glycans, but which N-glycans, right? which is the actual structure that we're getting. So we had to go to mass spectrometry to figure this out. And what we could do was use the fact that PNGASF can destroy the signal and thus presumably liberate the glycan from the RNA to, to liberate those two and then isolate the glycans and fly those into an LCMS uh, experiment. And what we were able to do was take peptide fractions from three cell lines and RNA fractions from three cell lines, perform this experiment, and cluster the different types of glycans that they each produced and understand the similarities between them. So we plotted those compositions and their intensities in a principal component space where each dot is a different experiment. Blue dots are RNA glycans and brown dots are peptide glycans. And you can notice that the blue dots are really close to each other and they're away from the brown dots. And that means that the types of glycans that are on RNAs are different than the peptides. And because they're physically closer in this principal component space, it means they're similar to each other. So the types of RNA glycans, even across different cell lines, seem to be more similar than the types of peptide glycans that the cells put on their protein or their proteome. One last piece of information from our mass spec that we thought was very interesting was not only are the RNA glycans more similar, but the RNA glycans seem to have more fucose and more sialic acid. And the reason why we thought that was interesting is because the fucose in red and the sialic acid in purple are these sort of decorative and functional glycans that can modulate um, adhesion, 
uh, and, and also signaling in the context of immune regulation. And so we thought that this might be starting to point us towards uh, potential activities of these glycans that are deposited on the RNA. And so this kind of additional resolution around the glycans started to update our model uh, where we can have this sort of cartoon small RNA that um, is now modified with these highly elaborated sialylated and fucosylated and glycan structures. But with all of this information, we, you know, we thought it was very cool that this is probably happening, but um, what is it doing? Where is it? Why do we care? Started to come up and we, we, we wanted to start answering some of these questions. And, and I thought that, um, you know, we found this in many contexts, so it might be hard to pin down a singular reason why these might exist. But if you know where something is, it's actually quite useful to know, but it's quite informative for what it's doing, right? Imagine you're in the living room versus in the kitchen. You might be doing very different things, even if you're that same person. So if you know where these glycoRNAs are, you can predict more easily probably what it's doing. So we imagined that the glycan might be, we hypothesized that the glycan might be driving its localization. And so we thought, where do other glycoconjugates go? Earlier on, I mentioned that glycoconjugates um, and, 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 and uh, lipids, like glycolipids and glycoproteins are on the extracellular space. They're, they're facing the extracellular space and they're also secreted proteins. And so we thought, well, maybe this is pushing those RNAs to the same place. So how could we test that? So we set up the same sort of experiment earlier on, as earlier on, but we changed one thing. We treated the cells with mannans, and before destroying the cells, we added an enzyme, which would cut our carbohydrate off, which would cut our sialic acid off. And the idea is the enzyme, while the cells are alive, won't easily get inside. It will only have access to the cell surface, glycans. So if we see a difference in the amount of glycoRNAs recovered from cells with or without sialidase while they were alive, it would suggest that the glycans for the RNAs are also on the cell surface. So we performed this experiment and got results like this, where when treating with sialidase in the second lane, you dramatically change the amount of recovered glycoRNA. And when we quantified this across a number of different cell lines, we saw this was very reproducible. And it was not simply that we were losing some glycoRNA signal, we lost most of the glycoRNA signal. So usually between 50 and 80% of all the glycoRNA signal we could recover was labile to a live cell treatment with these sialidases, suggesting that much of the glycoRNA was actually on the cell surface and exposed to the environment. So this was really exciting for us, but was kind of a weird thing to be saying. Um, and so we wanted to be pretty sure that this was actually occurring. And so up until now, basically all of the assays have been relying on this glycan reporter but what if something is weird about that and giving us weird results um, that we would wanna make sure that you know, we're, not getting, we're not getting a biased answer. And, and so this sort of the other part of the prediction was we're saying glycoRNA. So there should be RNA on the cell surface. So we should be able to measure the RNA. We should be able to not have to use the glyco reporter. We should be able to look at the RNA side. So we set up this otherwise complicated experiment that I'll try to walk through it. The idea is that we could bring a proximity labeling enzyme like a peroxidase to the cell surface with lectins, which are glycan binding proteins. And what we could do is have that enzyme spray biotin on whatever it's nearby on the cell surface while the cell's alive. And we could ask if that lectin is ever near an RNA. And on the left-hand side is an example of using a lectin that we know would not be on an RNA. It's that high mannose structure that I showed earlier. On the right-hand side of this cartoon are two examples of lectins that would bind glycans we think are, are, are on RNA. And so we would expect there to be a difference between, for example, CONA, which is, which is a cartoon of the left, and MAA2 or WGA, which are the two lectins on the right. So we could do this biotinylation on live cells, extract RNA, and then ask if we saw a biotin signal. And again, this biotin signal that we see or don't see would be inserted into the RNA itself, not the glycan. And so the data is shown now on the right-hand side. So the first two lanes show both the control and then this CONA experiment where 
in, in neither case do we see RNA. And in a control experiment, we showed that Kana is actually very active in labeling cell surface proteins. So it's not that the Kana is not working the way we want, it's just that Kana is nowhere near RNA. But in, the, in sort of stark contrast, when you look at the next lanes, you can see really bright signal for MAA2 and WGA, which suggests that when you bind MAA2 or WGA to the cell surface and you spray biotin, there's RNA nearby. And what was really, really interesting is the only signal we see is of this blobby type that's highly high molecular weight. So the only signal we see runs like it's a glycoRNA. So whenever we label RNA on the cell surface, it's a glycoRNA. And the last two lanes are very informative as well because we were able to show and importantly show that this signal is RNA sensitive. So it is really RNA. And then the kind of key here, and it's really informative for the way all this stuff runs in the gel, is that we can now destroy the sialic acid with sialides, but maintain our label because our label is not the manase. So now we can literally monitor where the RNA is going in the gel uh, with the with change in the charge to mass ratio of the RNA, of the glycoRNA. So when you get rid of all the sialic acid with the sialidase, which removes a bunch of negative charge, now the glycoRNA is extremely slow in the gel. It barely can leave the well, which suggests that a lot of the migratory potential of this glycoRNA is related to the sialic acid state of the glycan, which is sort of corroborating our previous uh, manosidase experiments and, and can explain why such a short RNA could have such a, an apparently slow migration in these types of gel formats. So this was all very consistent and, and nice, but this is actually a very annoying experiment to do from like a technical perspective. So we wanted to validate this in, in, a, in an orthogonal way, but also bring it into a, a place that would be easier to assay. And so the the sort of recycle hypothesis is that there's RNA on the cell surface. So this sort of trivial experiment should be, a trivial experiment should be able to be done, which is using an antibody and doing a flow cytometry experiment. So you can take cells, stain them with an anti-RNA antibody, and then ask, do any cells shift? Is, is the antibody bound to any cells? And indeed we could do this. We, we could see that in this case with HeLa cells, about 20% in this cell culture would shift to be very positively bound by the antibody that stained with RNA. This shift was uh, sensitive to RNAs, just like we showed in that very first gel, and we could recover it with an RNAs inhibitor. So again, we wanted to kind of come full circle and show that any of the RNA cell that we saw on the cell surface was similarly sensitive to enzymatic activity and selectively sensitive to the RNAs activity of the prep. Um, but but the, this is sort of a tool compound and really only proves that, helps to prove that there's RNA on the cell surface. So, you know, what, what do we think could it be, what do we think it could be doing? And I've been mentioning that there's, you know, this mad NAS reporter and, and sialic acid sort of this whole time. And the reason why is because sialic acid is this incredibly important regulatory molecule, this incredibly important um, monosaccharide that sits at the ends of all of these glycans. And the reason why it's important is because there's a very large family of cell surface receptors called Siglex. It's actually the largest family um, in the human genome of immunomodulatory receptors, like single family of the same type. And these are all uh, highly and selectively expressed on immune cells. So you can see the identities of their immune uh, cell expressions uh, below each of the cartoons. But the key is that they all have these Pac-Man-like domains at the end, which like binding sialic acid. And they each bind slightly different forms of sialic acid. And when they're bound, they can regulate the cells. They can, a lot of the time they're uh, immunomodulatory and they, they suppress activity of that immune cell. Uh, the convenient thing here is that all of these are sold as recombinant uh, FC fusion proteins. And so you can do another uh, relatively simple flow cytometry experiment where you could take cells, bind these things like FCs to the cells and ask, do any of the glycoligands that are being bound by the Siglec receptors, uh, are any of those labile to RNAs? Which would suggest that their ligands are at least in part glycoRNAs. And so we did the same experiment and have a couple of interesting results. So if you look at this, uh, when, you're, when you're looking at these plots, again, shifting to the right is more binding 
And so, for example, SIGLEX7 is a fantastic binder. It loves binding HeLa cells. But it turns out it doesn't care at all if you've added RNAs. You can add as much RNAs as you want. SIGLEX7 still is going to bind to the cells. But what's very interesting and exciting for us is that this is not the case with other SIGLEX. So in, the, in particular, SIGLEX11 and SIGLEX14 have this shift off the baseline. So, they, so HeLa cells do express some ligands for SIGLEX11 and SIGLEX14. And those ligands are susceptible to RNAs, suggesting that some of them are indeed cell surface glycoRNAs. And so this sort of brings me to the, the model that we, that we, that we are presenting and, and thinking about, where um, on the cell surface, we think there are these highly conserved, small non-coding RNAs that are broadly expressed um, across many tissues and many cell types. The types of glycans that are being put on these RNAs are highly sialylated and highly fucosylated, and they're of this N-glycan structure uh, or N-glycan type. I didn't get into it uh, today, but we find that these are broadly expressed. And so across every uh, cell type or tissue type, we see them. And when we've been looking in different organisms, such as humans, mice, hamsters, and even zebrafish, we can find these glycoconjugates. And so we think this is sort of a broadly, um, a broadly occurring phenomenon. We're kind of looking, looking deeper into the scope. And of course, as is, as is cartooned on the, on the left-hand side, um, there's a lot of uh, evidence now for these to be presented on the external surface of cells, sort of in the environment, the, the, the uh, extracellular environment of, uh, of cells. Um, but I want to just finish now with a couple of new things and just like general, uh, general ideas that we've been thinking about. So um, I, I've you know, exclusively focused on sialic acid here, but it turns out, of course, that this is not the only um, monosaccharide, we have many monosaccharides and, and the, the composition of, of the carbohydrates um, can vary depending on what type you're looking at. And the reporters are, are gonna be biased for, for looking at specific types. And so man is our last is our last lane, our fourth lane here, but there are other common azido sugars that you could use to label, to label cells. And so we started doing some of this and are starting to find new patterns. So, the no sugar is a nice control. It shows that there's not a lot of background here. But what we sort of found is very interesting is, um, you know, Galnaz, this third lane, produces a lot of different signal. Not only is the top signal a slightly more intense and slightly lower molecular weight, but now there's this uh, much lower molecular weight signal that's running below the 18S RNA. And then sort of maybe surprisingly, or I, I don't know, unsurprisingly, this glycnaz uh, uh, reagent has no signal. So it's, so it's totally incapable of getting into uh, RNA glycan conjugates. Um, and this is only three of, of many other types of metabolic reporters that could be used to kind of start to begin to expand the scope of, of what we're thinking about. So this is one, one I think, just example of, of how little we know about this. Um, but beyond, beyond sort of, uh, thinking deeper about the, the specific results. Um, part of what we've been really focused on now is kind of refining the techniques because I think your results are uh, only as good as you are confident in your tools. And so the, the question is gonna be, are we seeing what is really there or are we getting a biased answer because we think the tools are working the way we want? And so as an example, uh, all of these gels, as I mentioned before, the process is running them, you separate out by, by molecular weight, then you transfer them to a membrane, and then you image what's on the membrane. So that middle part has to work. If you don't transfer everything to the membrane, well, you will not be looking at all of the stuff. And so uh, we usually um, buy a, a northern blot transfer buffer from Thermo Fisher for like hundreds of dollars per liter. Um, and this is a result that I was got it, we got recently. And what you can see is after transfer, if you image the gel part, so the part that should be totally transferred out of, the canonical buffer that is used still has RNAs left. Mm. Now, if you change the pH, if you go up a little bit or way down, you can get full transfer. And 
I mean, the comical thing here is that this is sodium chloride and sodium hydroxide. So they're, they're, mm. they're charging you like $250 for three molar salt and like <laughs> 20 millimolar hydroxide. Um, so, so, you know, you can just like save a lot of money or whatever doing it that way. But uh, more importantly, uh, the results are different. So the bottom panel is what do the glycoRNA signals look like? So if you look at the last two columns, first you can appreciate that the, the commercial buffer doesn't even give you the most amount of signal. So you're losing signal in the place we wanna see it in the high molecular weight glycoRNA range. But now if you look all the way on the left-hand side in the first column, not only are you not getting all of the glycoRNA signal, you're not getting all the background. And not getting all the background is very dangerous because if you think it's clean and then you make an interpretation, you may be making a wrong interpretation. And so it's really important <laughs> to know mm. how all of your stuff is working and get all the, get all the data out, get all the stuff through. Mm. Um, another, another consideration, um, because we're, we're manipulating RNA, we're, we're, we're doing a bunch of chemical extractions and enzymatic digestions and purifying it a bunch, is how do you actually do that purification? Um, presumably you want high yield across all of those uh, steps so that you don't lose material similar to this. And so we usually use column-based uh, cleanup chemistry, so silica columns uh, and sort of normal phase columns to, to, to clean up and desalt the RNA, um, but this can also lead to issues. So this is just using the Zymo columns as an example, but this is, this is true for every other type of column because they're all the same. Um, if you take RNA and you do a singular column cleanup from the first and second lanes following a procedure that is quoted as being able to recover small RNAs, which critically for the glycoRNAs are the RNAs we're looking at, you will lose almost half of your material mm. every time you do a column cleanup. And so <laughs> I, didn't explicitly, I didn't explicitly say it, but when we extract out of trizol, that's a column cleanup. When we do a proteinase K, that's a column cleanup. When we do the DBCO click chemistry, that's a column cleanup. So there's three columns that go from cells to gel, which means if you go half, 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 you have like nothing left if you can always lose half each time. So with small tweaks, um, and these are maybe intuitive. Um, if you think about the way the chemistry and the precipitation is working, you can actually make these columns perform incredibly robustly. So you can get over 90% recovery each time by just adding a little bit of extra ethanol to, uh, to make the precipitation a bit, a bit more robust before binding to the column. So um, just some thoughts at the end here on, on, on the things we're kind of like going two steps back to make sure everything is gonna be good and, and that we're gonna move forward in new, new biology. But I'll finish with just um, acknowledging the people who helped, helped along the way my postdoc mentor was incredibly important and is incredibly generous. Uh, Carolyn Bertozzi, she's an excellent person and, and chemist. Um, the people in the lab that helped are, are, are sort of shown in pictures on the left-hand side. And uh, like was mentioned, we just started the Flynn Lab um, here at Harvard about one year ago. And uh, the people in the lab are, are pictured and with the names. And so, um, yeah, we're all, we're all excited and studying different aspects of, of uh, glycoRNA biology. And um, yeah, really happy to, happy to be here and have, have gotten the opportunity to talk and uh, you know, excited and happy to take any questions that might be, uh, might be, uh, might've come in the talk. All right, thank you very much. So um, I have questions, but again, we want to open it up. So if, and uh, anyone has a question, um, you could unmute your, yourself, your mic, and, um, and ask your question. So one of the things I'm thinking about is, um, so I, I've read from um, papers from, uh, I forget the researcher's name now, but she is out at Stanford, I believe, um, that there is some correlation between the concentration, the abundance of sialic acids on the surface and different disease states like cancer. Are you starting to think about maybe some correlations between um, these glycoRNA and other and disease states? 
Yeah. Um, I bet that's Carolyn. Um, yes. I bet that's her work. Um, <laughs> yeah. She, there, there's a really there's a really interesting connection between hypersyalation mm -hmm. and cancer cells right with the with the with at least one example of this being immune and an immune evasion so if you can get rid of the sialic acid on the cancer cells now the immune system can destroy that cancer mm -hmm. and so we're very interested to look at different disease states so normal versus tumor um, maybe normal versus autoimmune um, or, or generally inflamed mm -hmm. and ask how do, how do the glycoRNAs change? Are there more, are there more glycoRNA conjugates? Is the, is the glycan itself different? So is the composition different? Like you're saying, is there more sialic acid or less sialic acid? And so some of the new tools that we're thinking about and even just the efficiency gains that we see from these sort of dumb like optimizations uh, are going to be let are are going to let us start going into those questions. Okay. Anyone else has questions? You could. John, you could unmute and ask your question. Uh sure. Okay. So I was just saying, uh, if like the glyco RNAs could be on certain organelles, like uh, the membrane brown organelles. And like, if that could be used to like, identify some of the functions, if some of the organelles have different, if some of the membrane brown proteins on organelles have some different functions than others. Yeah, it's really interesting. It's a, it's a, it's a question we're trying to think about, um, like designing that experiment. So it's, it's pretty, it's, it's a little bit easier to ask what's on the surface and then not on the surface. When you get into the organelle level, I think you need a really good, probably really good protein markers that are sequestered in those places. So these exist, these exist, but there's always a little bit of fuzz with biology because nothing, you know, nothing's picked. But one thing that we've been thinking about along the lines of your, along the lines of your idea is if we can, <clears throat> if we can um, like label the trans Golgi versus the cis Golgi versus the ER versus an endosome, and then try to see, you know, is there RNA in each one of those or which RNAs are in each one of those? Um, uh, but it's, it, that's more of just a design. It's sort of like a more of a design hurdle that we have to cross. But I think the, I think that's a very good question that we, we hope to answer soon, but we don't know yet. Okay. Isabella. Hello. Um, my question was just, uh, what are the potential pathologies that could be treated better? knowing more about glycoRNAs versus the study of proteomics or DNA and proteins? Yeah, um, I think that the way I think about it is this is just a different hand that's gonna be playing a role in similar diseases that everyone thinks about. Mm -hmm. So. So I think, for example, uh, tumor immune interactions will be very interesting to study here. Mm. And it may not be that RNA is better to, to target in a cancer context, but it's just a new way to, to address that interface. Mm. And, and it may not even necessarily, it, it could be worse. It, it, you could have a, a, a less strong impact but for example, if you're thinking about how to disrupt that, promote that interaction, and you don't know all of the players, you'll make, you'll design a worse experiment, or you'll design a worse therapy or diagnostic. And so I think the way we're approaching these questions is, um, this is now just another thing you have to measure whenever you're considering this biology. Mm -hmm. So when we want, so if, if we're really curious about um, how do natural killer cells 
kill cancer or, or, or address their, you know, address their function, we'll be looking at cell surface glycoproteins, cell, for, cell surface glycoRNAs, cell surface lipids, and things right. like this, and consider all of those pieces. Mm-hmm. I would love it if the <laughs> RNA was the lynch, lynch pin in one of these, one of these things, and we'll keep looking. Um, but that's kind of how we're, that's kind of how we're thinking about it. It's, it's, it's fine if it doesn't have to be better. Um, it's as long as it's a, as long as it's a player, I think is the way we want it. Yeah. So there's just like a more complete view of mm. how the molecules interact. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. So when did you publish your seminal paper on this topic? Glyco? Um, I think it was in May or something May like that. Last year, right? last year. Have you yeah. seen, have you seen any up? I know it's a short period of time, but have you seen an uptick in other researchers now getting into the game? I know other people are working on it. Okay. I don't know with a lot of detail. Okay. <laughs> I don't know with a lot of detail yet. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's a, you know, I think um, I'm, I, I hope other people think it's interesting enough right. to work on it. Yeah. Um, uh, I also think there's, uh, you know, in the, in the backdrop of me wanting to do everything, which is impossible, mm-hmm. Uh, there's plenty of stuff to do. So, right. um, you know, uh, everyone should, everyone can, everyone can come along and, and, and try to try to do something, I think. Yes, yeah. Yes. So you focused on silylated and fu- fucoslated um, mm-hmm. uh, RNAs. Um, do you, have you seen other types beyond the silated ones and the... Yeah, in our mass spec, which itself has its own biases, we saw, we did, we did mass spectrometry to look for N-glycans. Okay. So we didn't actually look for O-glycans because it's a totally different right. preparatory scheme. Right. In the context of looking for N-glycans, what we found was many of them are of the, complex or hybrid forms, which is a sort of a glycobiology term in terms of the structure of them. Mm-hmm. Most had at least one fucose or one sialic acid. Mm. Some of the structures had neither, but most of them had at least one of those, if not both of those. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It just occurred to me, and again, you guys come on through, Dave, Oh, biochemist. Um, it just kind of occurred to me that uh, we have blood types, right? Um, that are differentiated, of course, by the different types of um, carbohydrates. Um, I'm just wondering, just brainstorming, kind of wondering if there's some correlation between blood types and maybe the type or amount or some sort of variable variability between um, that and glyco RNAs. I mean, it hasn't been, a, you know, but a few months that you brought it out, but, you know, <laughs> it just occurred to me that there might be, could be. Yeah, the blood groups are interesting. I always, I always find it funny because I, like I mentioned very early in the talk, I, I for a long time, didn't really understand what glycobiology was, but everyone knows of blood groups. And of course they're just carbohydrates. Yeah, <laughs> but, exactly. Um, uh, but but um, I think, you know, I don't know if there's a connection between the blood groups and the glycoRNA, but what I, what I found to be interesting was um, the, the putative structure, the putative structures of of glycans that we saw on the RNAs mm-hmm. have, have some structures that look like adhesion molecules. Mm-hmm. So there are, there are these, there are these like Sal Lewis X or Sal Lewis A right. structures that are purely carbohydrate. They don't, they don't really consider what they're connected to, but it's just a little structure at the end of many of the, the, gly- the glycans. 
some of the ones we saw on the RNAs looked like this, like they're, right. they're putative structures. So that that's where that's where the way that's that's why I said we were thinking about how could sialic acid regulate could how could it regulate with these siglex? That's one idea for function, mm -hmm. and then maybe there's some context where um, where these other structures might facilitate uh, an, an adhesion or a, a physical connection that's um, reliant on the RNA. And so maybe there's some, some dynamic response that's easier to control with an RNA ligand versus a protein ligand or, you know, template. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, it's all, I mean, all I want to think about is the function, but then the, right. what ends up happening is uh, we don't have the tools to, to easily study the functions to build the tools. Right. So once we build the tools, we'll go and study, we'll, we'll try to study the function. Yeah, yeah. Okay, anyone else has questions on mute? So I'm, yeah, I, uh -huh. yeah, I, I, got a, I got a question. This is, I know this is crazy, but could all, could, could it be just accidental? Could this, I mean, could could it simply be? I mean, just a, a, a non-specific and uh, a non-functional. Have you uh, changes on this on these uh, RNAs? Yeah, until I show someone that having more or having less has a phenotype, totally reasonable. <laughs> I'll say I'll say that you know we've been finding that like every place, every cell is making them and making them differently, seemingly differently. So there's, there's at least cell state regulation, but that doesn't exclude your, your hypothesis because if it's, you know, if a neuron looks different than a kidney cell looks different than uh, an, an embryonic stem cell, well, they're all different cells and they'll have different trash bins. Right. Mm -hmm. So then, so then it doesn't exclude that possibility yet, but what, what, what the, 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 the differentiation across cell types and cell states helps us find places where it might be more interesting. We can look for places where it's not a lot and add more of it. And we can look for places where it is a lot and take it away and see if there's a phenotypic outcome. So we're in the, we're in the process of doing that. And I think, uh, once we have at least n of one example of it doing something, we'll yeah. we'll feel uh, pretty happy about that. Yeah. Well, this is actually this is quite remarkable to be uh, on on the edge of something. I mean, your presentation here is revealing something so new, we right. we still don't know its functionality of it, and and that's fantastic. Uh, congratulations to you, and I really wish you uh, success and. Uh, I'm, I'm just so glad for you that you've stumbled across this and this could have, who knows, you know, the, you're literally looking at something that could have a lot of meaning or it could have uh, just tangential meaning, but you don't know and you're the first. Congratulations. That's just awesome. Thank, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, the, hot, the high risk, high reward. Uh... <laughs> That's exactly Par right. Paradigm. That's exactly it's, right. It's, it's what's going That's on. exactly right. I bet um, you funding agencies don't even know what to do with you yet, or you may not even have approached any of them about funding. Perhaps you have, but I mean, yeah, it's uh, you know, it's always a it's always a difficult conversation. But I think what I'll say what I'll say is that um, uh, I I probably have a pretty high risk tolerance <laughs> just among among many yeah, people, yeah, yeah. but. But I think that it might not be obvious that I did other things in the background of this. And so mm -hmm. when I started my postdoc, there was another, I mean, I came in with not this idea. I, I was, it, was a, it was an evolution of things. Um, but um, I, I, I had and made progress on and published a different paper that I felt like I knew the, how I could get an outcome. Like I, I was very confident mm -hmm. that there was data I could collect, it would be an interesting topic. And I did that. <laughs> and so there was, yeah. there's always like a little bit of security of, uh, uh, okay, if this thing just totally blows up any day, <laughs> um, <laughs> there's something else there. So I, I will have a piece of work that is, that is done. So 
um, it's all, it's always good, as you know, Charlie, like to have a little bit of balance, but um, I do have, a, I think I have a, a, a high risk appetite for, <laughs> for certain things. Well, good, good for you. That's, that, that's what, uh, you know, sort of a leading, bleeding edge a little bit. Yep. Yeah. So, so I was just wondering too, um, again, this is all new and everything, but have you thought about like making the um, synthetic glyco RNAs, like taking an RNA, you know, and have a, a carbohydrate chemist basically look at of a diversity of, of groups attached to the RNA. And for example, going back to the blood, um, you know, the, the, the blood types, um, I think that could be a very interesting blend of organic chemistry, carbohydrate chemistry, and, you know, attaching it and, and just seeing what happens. Yeah, we're we're definitely we're definitely thinking along those lines. Um, uh, the RNA part is not so bad. Okay, you can right. you can you can you can just order whatever RNA yeah, you want yeah. with like an arbitrary chemistry. Yeah, the gly the glycan side is a little bit harder. Oh yeah, I would say carbohydrate chemistry you know, is tough. Yeah, <laughs> I would say you know even in the last like one or two years though, there have been some really nice. Um, cell-free and chemoenzymatic strategies to do uh, automated glycan synthesis, even in the realm of N-glycans, these really elaborate structures. And so we're looking into ways to get that material and put them on RNAs and start to see, start yeah. to see what they're doing. Um, yeah. But you need, yeah, you need some, um, some flexible chemistry to put them together. You obviously want to make sure that's high efficiency. Um, some things are, are, are not great on RNA or nucleic acids in general. Um, uh, and so you have to kind of like play around with that, but, um, it's a little bit of a, not that I don't, I, I like these, <laughs> I, it's a little bit of a fishing expedition because you're going to, we're going to make this molecule and then hope it does something sure. or, or, you know, yeah. put it on what cell or that cell, but it's, a uh, it's something that we really want to do. Yeah. We're, we're kind of like in the process of making that material. Right. Right. So I think we'll go with one more question. John has another question. John, are you there? Yeah. Yeah, I was just wondering if the fact that the uh, binding between the RNA and the glycan is like, uh, is different between that and the protein and the glycan, like does that open up any new possibilities for different like carbohydrate chains that, when it, that didn't exist before? Or the fact that there's like, it's an RNA and not a protein, does that like, uh, do you have like, do you suspect any like new functions that that may open up or differences or stuff like that? Yeah, so, so um, one, so the second, the second question is sort of like consideration of the template. And I think there are reasons to imagine a cell may have had differential utility for templates. Um, in particular, I think the, the flux of biosynthesis and recycling will be dramatically different for a lipid and an RNA and a protein. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, the transcriptional response to make a small RNA, that the distance there is very short. It's, it's you, you go from DNA to RNA and you have, you have your template. If you need to make a glycoprotein, you have to do all of this elaborate stuff. You have to make the mRNA, you have to splice the mRNA, you have to do the translation, you have to go costly, you have to fold all of this stuff. Yeah. You have to maybe insert in a membrane. So you might, so, so why would there be utility in having an RNA template over or, or in adjacent to a protein template? I think there are potentially regulatory or flux differences that you could, that the cell could be afforded by having multiple templates of different polymers. Mm -hmm. The other question is something that is of dramatic importance, I think, and we're actively and very deeply working on this, which is how atomically um, are these things connected? Because chemically, it doesn't make any sense. There is no reasonable way for an unmodified RNA to both get coupled to an N-glycan and be sensitive 
um, in the way we're seeing with, for example, P and GSF. Hmm. It's like not a good, there's either, there's either novel enzymology that we don't, that we're discovering with P and GSF enzyme, which seems less likely, or there's some new connector between the RNA and the glycan that we don't know yet. And so we're using as many tools as we can uh, try, including but not limited to like AFM, cryo-EM, mass spectrometry to define the atoms that lay between the RNA and the glycan. Wow. Um, but we do think that there's something new about that. Yeah. And whether that's, you know, yeah, to, you know, a new, new activity of OST, um, a new intermediate enzyme that's, that's putting this modification on the RNA to allow for OST modification in a canonical way. Um, any of the above is interesting. <laughs> we just have to define it. So we're, we're, we're working hard on that. Oh, one, one quick other thing. I know we said only one last question, but ahead, you mentioned ahead. that like, uh, that it's, I know it, this is like newer, right? It just kind of came out. Do we know the cycling like pathways for the uh, uh, glyco RNAs? Like, is that known well? No, it's, it's not known. It's, it's known not well or poorly, which is not known. <laughs> um, we're, we're, we're in the process of defining that um, sort of systematically, but uh, we, don't, we, don't, um, we don't know the genes yet for either bias. We, we, know that, we know that N glycan biosynthesis is really important, but that's so self-critical. You can't, you, it's, it's, not as, it's not as useful to know that. We know that N glycans are on the RNAs, but you don't want to mess up N glyco biogenesis or else the cell will die. So you can't start to dissect function if it's, if it's at the resolution of N glycans. That's too, that's too zoomed out. Hmm. Yeah. This was good. A whole new world. That's what science is all about. And whether you get some sort of functionality from this or whatever, at least we have known something that we didn't know before. It, I it agree. Broad, <laughs> it broadens the field. It broadens the view. And everybody working in, in this sort of area now has to wonder, hmm, is there a glyco RNA involved here? <laughs> <laughs> yep. So yeah, we'll um, we'll have you back after you Sounds get great. your Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> I just want a function. Uh, just give me a function. That's all I, I, know, want. I yeah. know. Just do all the right. science. It's it's all only right. important. Yes. Yeah. So thank you so much for leading us out in our second semester. It was a very good start and we wish you all the best in your research. Yeah, Indeed. it was great to, great to be here and um, happy to happy to give the talk. Okay then, take care. All right. All right. Bye-bye.